Kubernetes for Humans. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kubernetes for Humans podcast. Today with me in the show, we have two special guests. So if you can please introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Elizabeth K. Joseph. Um, I work over at IBM on <laughs> running the open source program office for IBM Z and Linux One mainframes. So in, my name is Holger Wolf. I'm the chief product owner for Red Hat OpenShift on the IBM C and Linux One platforms and taking care of getting things ported to, to the platform with the team. Okay, usually I start with like a short background and you are too, so try to keep it brief, but just okay, give me like a bit of like what did you do, how did you came to too, IBM, so to, keep to it programming brief, at all just and give Kubernetes. give me like a bit of what did you do, so, how did you came yeah, to IBM. Yeah, so my, my to path has been at a all winding one. Kubernetes. I've been involved in open source yeah, software so yeah. for about over 20 years now. Um, and my first job was doing Linux systems administration. So I did that and I worked on, you know, I was racking servers and data centers back in the day and like, you know, building up my career through that. Um, and I, I worked on distributed systems. Um, so I worked on OpenStack for a time. I worked on Apache Mesos for a little while. Um, and then uh, started working on Kubernetes a bit. Um, and then I was kind of looking for a change. Um, and my... I, I was put into contact with someone at IBM and they're about five years ago and they're like, hey, you want to work on mainframes? And I'm like, I have no idea what those are. <laughs> um, but I, I looked into the tech and I, I spoke with some of their technical team and I was, actually got really excited about it. So I joined IBM five years ago uh, to work on mainframes. Um, and in, in the course of that, in 2019, um, I spoke at KubeCon on the state of of Kubernetes on the mainframe. And that was a really fun talk. Um, I should do a refresh sometime soon. <laughs> um, did a lot change in like a mainframe on Kubernetes? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we'll go back to it like in a second and hear really? about that. Yeah, about so that. that's, that's what I work on now. So running the open source program office, obviously Kubernetes is in our portfolio of projects that we sort of keep an eye on and make sure that it's still running well on the platform. Very good. And I'm good. So in my, my career was maybe after the university, maybe I was always interested in Linux and, and all those stuff, but there was no company really taking care for that. And therefore, after my studies, I was interested in IBM because I was making a practical semester there as a student. It was really fun because of a lot of technology. Then I started and then I started with COS, and the mainframe really in 1998. So it's quite a while ago. Um, and then I had really the chance when Linux came to the platform in 2000 that I jumped to this team as a performance engineer. Um, and really this was like, you should imagine there was no open source at IBM at this time at all. So this was kind of the first project open source. And management was not happy to see this in the first moment. Uh, because, I mean, this is, what is this? What what are we doing there? And therefore, we had a lot of things we had to, to explore and to understand here. And um, then it was progressing, and I was going through several kind of other projects, like looking into KVM, looking into um, into cloud resources when this emerged with, with containers. And then um, and when... when OpenShift came to the platform or was wanted to get on the platform. I jumped on this because of, of the interesting technology behind this based on Linux, based on virtualization, which is playing a role. And then, and then, um, was looking into the testing areas and then getting more and more involved into the project so that, that I'm, I'm getting the, the lead to it and, and was looking into all those technology kind of environments and how this is stacked, how this is operated, what what it means for the Linux side. Okay. Okay. Also like a super interesting like like story for both of you. So Elizabeth, maybe like let's start with you and feel free to, to jump in. But if you can like explain a bit like what is a mainframe or like you know, you said that uh, like five years ago they told you, hey can can you can I should you do you want to join the mainframe team? And you weren't sure. So if you can like explain a bit I will say as someone that never worked like on real mainframe, like my answer would probably be no, be no because it has like terrible PR. 
mainframe, but maybe you can shed some light on why mainframe is not that bad, right? And what does it mean like mainframe on Kubernetes? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, when, actually my, my first answer to IBM when they asked me if I wanted to work on mainframes was no. Uh, yeah, that's not, that's the answer we'll um, play with the tech. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, a part of it was that I didn't know anything about them. And, and you're was right, it? I mean, the PR um, historically has been not great um, because like one, they're, they're, um, they're not real, right? Like in, in movies you see them and like everyone wants to hack the mainframe. There's always like a mm -hmm. climax in the movie for someone like, you know, it, and it's, it's all ridiculous and has nothing to do with that. So there's like the fantasy mainframes and then there's actually the real ones. Um, and it turns out the real ones, um, as I said, like they're actually super cool. Um, and, and there's a bunch of like marketing numbers that are thrown out there, like, you know, percentage, you know, like X percentage of banks and X percentage of airlines, um, and which is actually a huge chunk, like most of them in the world, um, are using mainframes. And the one okay. thing they say is you know, when you swipe your credit card, it's going to go through a mainframe at some point. Um, right. so these things are, it turns out everywhere and still powering our global economy. But what really, and that that's great, that's cool. <laughs> um, cool. But what really got me is like the hardware. Um, so when I started diving into it, even before I joined IBM, I was looking into it just to make sure I wanted this job. Um, and the processors, um, they're designed by IBM and they have lots of innovative, interesting things in them. They have like large caches because most of the workloads on the mainframe are data driven. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think historically, the companies that needed mainframes back in the day, I mean, they were the airlines and healthcare and government, and they were organizations that were leveraging data. Most people didn't need to work with data, but these ones did. Um, mm -hmm. And it turns out that that really aged well. <laughs> um, it turns out today, everyone is using data. Like my cousin, who's an artist, he's like, you know, going through analytics on how to promote his art better by, right. you know, leveraging all kinds of thing so even yeah. artists are using <laughs> data machines and that's what these machines were built for from the beginning so the architecture and the hardware um, inside of them are really built for that um, they don't have storage on the machines the machine is basically like a computing monster it's got a really? ton of RAM a ton of CPU everything is really fast and connected tightly in these drawers and then there's a bunch of um, cards that do very specific things like you know connecting to the storage um, there's like an 8 uh, hardware security module built in um there is on chip compression and decompression which works on linux so like if you're using gzip on the mainframe that's going to be using hardware driven um, uh, stuff uh same with crypto a bunch of crypto algorithms are interpreted on the cpu itself um, the? with the latest release there's an ai accelerator which makes inferencing really fast um so you train your model oh. somewhere and then you bring it over to the mainframe to execute so Things like fraud detection happen very, very fast because it's built into the hardware. And, you know, digging into this technical, it's just so cool to be working on. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. so you, you, forgot, you forgot the, the LPAR partitioning and so on. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a cloud in a box and has the capacity to really run a lot of things. And this was, was always things... With, with, which is fantastic because it's even I'm 20 years on or more than 20 years on that platform. It's renewing itself, but keeps what is good for. And this is this is really amazing. I've never seen such a platform, which is kind of that stable and and scalable. So so maybe let me ask you like two questions and then I will, will go to your work. Like first of all, it's mainframe like a growing team. Like is then usage of like mainframe is growing like. With each day, are more people using mainframe or less people using mainframe? <laughs> I would say it's stable used <laughs> and it's very important. I, I mean, a mainframe is nothing you put on under your table. I mean, <laughs> now maybe nowadays there are there are options you you can you can have that, and there's some growth, but it's it's kind of a, a data monster, and and depending on your use case, and and I think the use case defines the set of people which might use the mainframe. Okay. It's corporate. Uh, we see a growing customer set of that and, 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 and a growing need to get engineers on board. So I see growth here um, to work more and more on, on those topics because we have more and more things to deliver. Um, but it's still kind of, of a special edge, edge case because not everybody can afford this one and needs that okay. kind of system. It's a back-end, classical back-end environment, I would say. Right. 
Okay. Yeah. And speaking of the form factor as well. So they, they, these days they're, they don't take up a whole room. They sit fit in like a 19 inch rack spot. Well, um, last year we even announced a rack mountable version, which I think starts at like 20 U. <laughs> so, um, okay. Okay. Super. But I don't remember like, uh, I don't remember what, maybe like, you know, maybe in a brief, like, no, later, later we'll do like Kubernetes and mainframe and how, how does those two like uh, live together. But Olga, maybe you can share a bit about what you're working on and, and yeah. I mean, yeah, what, what we are working on, I mean, mainly I'm responsible, very concrete to, to get the OpenShift platform okay. working on the mainframe and working very closely with Red Hat and the community. I mean, depending on when you're looking at the overall stack, there are a lot of projects which are we have first to identify in the either it's already ported from okay. list teams or or it's or we have to take care that we are porting it and, and get it in, integrated um, and then get it on the mainframe if, if, because it's a special architecture. It's it's something which you are not getting for free because the hardware is not available. There's IBM cloud wise, you, you have to the possibility to to get this kind of hardware and there are services which are for free for developers and you might have builds for QEMO, but it's if you want to test it and so on it's it's kind of where we are getting integrated and in, in working out what's available um the downside of it maybe not everything is there because not all communities are onboarded yet and and not all is ported but when we are talking about porting it's not li like an effort like an, an amazing, horrible effort. It's sometimes a recompile only. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a little bit more. Biggest problems mm -hmm. are little or big engine mm -hmm. issues because we are the only big engine that's on at the planet right now, potentially, uh, or pro or commercial one. And um, and but that's that's minor problems there. So the main thing is really getting things being being in. So, the, the, as I said, the platform itself is a very modern one. So it's it's has very it's very capable from from a CPU kind of speed of things, and that that makes it very interesting. So because you have something which is which is really modern, and 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 this thrills me a lot. And also the people when when they are starting, when when I have new team members or so. Um, first of all, oh, what's the mainframe? Then they see the Linux console or the, the open shifting and then, oh, that's not very different to, to all of it, which, which is kind of a cool because you have hundreds of CPUs available, terabytes of storage if you want, and, and all this is seamlessly, seamlessly integrated. So, so, so maybe walk with me, like, you know, from what I know about like mainframe and, and you said to yourself, mm -hmm. it has a lot of CPU, it has a lot of RAM. In my head, it's great for, I don't know, like monolithic application because you can put everything very close to you. Everything is in the RAM and everything is very, very fast. How does it work like in a Kubernetes, like distributed microservice architecture? Why should I combine the two? Yeah. Maybe maybe one thing, the, 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 the mainframe is architected not just for monolithic things, it's uh -huh. architected for transactional workloads as well. Uh -huh. and so to scale with a lot of processes. Mm -hmm. So if you think of, of Kubernetes, then you think of a lot of processes which are running in parallel on the platform, many, many small things which are coming up, going down. So the scheduling and so on. And and the system is really designed to to cope with that very easy and to handle this much more. And I would I would say since I was in performance working on that a lot. And we looked into to the scalability and to those issues, starting a lot of processes scaling up. We are scaling really, really, really like 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 a flat line, wow. and to 100 percent of the CPU being 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 utilized with a lot of processes, and it's not a problem. Context switching and so on, it's not a problem for the, it's it's even even much better designed on the platform. So therefore, for me, it's the perfect match. Uh, to get I, Kubernetes or something like this on Linux workloads on the platform. Additionally, to of course, there there are a lot of traditional workloads, also transactional system like Kix, where also some some kind of those those um, patterns are available. Uh, but therefore, it's very fitting very well to to this modern world of computing because it's it's designed for this as well and capable to do. So. 
Elizabeth, you want to also? Uh... <laughs> yeah, so a couple a couple of things I can I can interject here. Um, so one of the things we, we have to do with open source communities when we start working with them is just first education. Um, so when you know someone on Holgar's team you know submits a patch and says, "Hey, add S three ninety X support," um, the first question is usually, "What is that?" <laughs> or yeah. does anyone use that? Um, and then we kind of have to put on the show of yes, people use it. There we have you know um, all that. Also, it's really cool. Um, so in in that in that case, we you know I I do a lot of my my team is the ecosystem team. So what? I do um, a lot of conferences where I just give generic talks about um, uh, Linux on the mainframe or porting your open source application. Uh, actually, this year I did a couple on porting to various architectures. So I, I gave examples on on RISC and ARM and is along with S three ninety X. Um, kind of just educating developers that there are other architectures out there. Well, well, um, ARM has actually helped us a lot because they people know what an ARM is. You know, yeah. they know their Raspberry Pi or their watch or their phone. It's all ARM, um, huh. and that has kind of been an inroad for the work that I do. Um, in it, you say like, okay, you support ARM now. Now you know you can just add another architecture. Um, and to help with that, um, I mean, we mentioned like access to resources. Um, my team runs an open source cloud. Um, yeah, that's- uh, out of a university in New York. Um, so there's an application folks can fill out if they are running an open source project mm-hmm. and can get a VM. Um, yeah. We, you know, you can you can throw out some specs and I'll say yes or no, or, you know, I'll work with you yeah. on, on how much we can we can give out. Um, but that, that program is specifically so folks can test um, on the platform. Um, but again, like a lot of people just use QEMU. Um, I think the binaries from the Kubernetes project directly are cross-compiled, so they're compiled on x86. Yeah through emulation um and you know that that's okay but then like teams like holgar's team like they will run through make sure that those are actually working once they're yeah. pulled into something like OpenShift because <laughs> um emulation not perfect um and it's a little slow, so okay okay so so one of the things that you know you mentioned is that you gave a talk at kubecon i think you said like 2019 right mm-hmm. yep and if you would to give the same lecture today, a lot of change. So what have changed in like the mainframe Kubernetes space? Like what are like, yeah. what change? And also because I'm really clueless around that, like where are we going? Like in, in like w- what's the vision like in a couple of years, like what's on the road in this area? So the, the big thing that changed was um, there was basically no commercial support back in 2019. Um, the OpenShift work had begun, but there hadn't been like a production release. Um, and so it was kind of experimental, I believe, at the time. So my talk was very much like, hey, you can run Minikube. And, <laughs> um, you know, ranchers kind of working on this thing. Um, and since then, I mean, OpenShift is, is a mature product now on the platform. Um, with the latest release, you can actually run mixed. So like your host can be x86 and you can have S390X workers. And the opposite is true as well, which is really exciting because if you have a hybrid environment and you have the OpenShift, you know, OpenShift running there, you can sort of mix and match. Um, so companies can leverage the cloud as well because, you know, they're already invested in that with their microservices there and whatever. Usually like things that are... Um, like don't take advantage of the mainframe technologies. You can just, you know, toss them on the cloud and have that sort of mixed environment. And that's kind of the dream, right? <laughs> um, especially for for IBM and just this hybrid cloud vision um, of getting our customers, you know, put your data and put your applications and put everything where it makes sense instead of being, you know, pulled into something just because, um, you know, you feel like you have to do that. Um, and so that's, that's, I mean, that's some of the work that I'm most proud of from, you know, the OpenShift side. Um, Rancher briefly supported the platform, but I think they, they've put that on pause for now. Um, and so that that was a big deal. And then now it's a little bit less. So, you know, we still work very closely with Suze, um, but I think that's just, it's just not happening at the moment. Um, but there's definitely, you know, there's interest, there's there's clients. And I think Holgar can, can chime in a lot more <laughs> concrete examples um, of this as well. Yeah, but, but your example was the seamlessly running it where it's where it's fitting best is I think a good example for the customers because they they, they have needs to run things on on x86 but they have also the need to run it on on the Linux one IBM C form and and if they could combine this in one single cluster this is this is a it's a cool thing 
but even have have the ability to 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 install it on on the on the same platform but having other clusters so so the flexibility is is a big thing i would say and also that the platform i mean what how i see it is that the platform combines a lot because you have no this this differences on on that you operate always the same so you do not need to have the platform specifics being very well known so you have to set this up but developers are really hmm, doesn't matter more or less i mean yes it's another architecture you might need to be aware of it but to have that being in place this is pretty pretty cool and therefore they can start up to make their build process accordingly and, and so on so you would potentially see more of, of that of, of yeah, and it was actually it's actually funny i um, we have we also so we give out VMs to open source communities, but we also have a free version of the OpenShift environment. That's I think you get like two weeks of access to it just to test it okay. out. And and the funniest thing about that is you know, my you know my boss is like, hey, write write a write a, a tutorial for that so people can learn how to use it. And I'm like, it's the same as on x86. I could just pull down a random tutorial <laughs> on x86 and tell them to run it. Um, so, but anyway, I got the pressure and I wrote one about Nginx, but it is, it is identical. The only difference is you pull down a different container image because you have to pull down the S390X one instead of, you know, the, the x86. So that's the only thing I had to change really in the tutorial. And it just goes, you know, went to show that like, it's the same thing. Developers probably won't notice. Yep. So, so maybe like, you know, I'll, like maybe again, like two questions. Uh, Cause I'm really out of my like game here, right? Like I don't, I didn't work at like never on mainframe. So why and how big is like the open source mainframe community? Like again, if I would need to guess prior to this call, I will say a lot of like the mainframe is like you said, like you know the big banks, uh, telcos or like data companies fraud. It's not like the first thing that comes to mind when you are thinking about open source. So how big is the open source community? around mainframe and who are those people like are there normal people that love like this or they like is it big companies that are contributing as an open source to the greater good so maybe if you can share a bit about who is the community and yeah uh, so the community it's it's growing um and one of, one of the sort of cornerstones of the open source community on mainframe is the open mainframe project which is part of the linux foundation Mm -hmm. um, so that ha that's like the home of a bunch of different projects. A lot of them are focused on ZOS. Um, and so the Linux, I mean, in the mainframe world, you kind of have the ZOS folks and you have the Linux folks. And there's other, you know, proprietary operating systems in there. But broadly speaking, you have these two groups. And mm -hmm. one of the really fascinating things that's happening, not like, so I work mostly on Linux porting um, just because of my background. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah. I, I still oversee some of the ZOS stuff, but this was not as familiar to me. Um, but one of the things that's been so fascinating on the ZOS side is there's this project called ZOS Open Tools. And what they've been doing is they've been porting traditional um, tools that are traditionally Linux tools over to Unix system services, which is a Unix-like environment, on, like sort of bolted onto the mainframe. Um, but now everyone uses it. Um, but the thing is, when you log into Unix system services for the first time, you're like, oh, this looks familiar. And then you start running commands and they're just different enough to be irritating. <laughs> but one of the really cool things that this project has been doing is they are, they're porting bash, they're porting git, they're porting sudo, um, all these traditional tools, and they're contributing the patches upstream. <laughs> so now if you download bash, it's got ZOS support inside of it. Yeah. Just, you know, you just, you know, treat you know, do the flag and run it on ZOS. And so they, they have like over a hundred projects now. And so you really can change that Unix system environment to be something that developers may be more familiar with, like in a Linux environment. Yeah. And I just thought it was so cool that they're doing so much upstream work and just going into these projects that were traditionally Linux only. So Podman yeah. is now ported to ZOS. Um, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's, that's really something. Um, so, yeah. you know, even the ZOS side of the open source community is growing. Um, and there's a lot of interest there. As far as who's who's there, I mean, obviously a lot of IBMers, um, but there are yeah. other companies yeah. in the mainframe space, um, and so they're they're all involved as well. Um, a lot of the developers also come from clients, um, so people who get permission to work on open source. Yeah, software. that's. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess because um, the big the big thing is you know first you have to have familiarity with the mainframe, and secondly oh. you have to have access and a reason to do it. Um, so. 
I have worked with a few hobbyists, but honestly, there's not very many of them because it's kind of hard to pick up this as a <laughs> yeah, it's like a, like I feel like a, like expensive hobby or not the the one that you, <laughs> you know like I would go and buy like a Raspberry Pi at like and like mm-hmm. I whatever at like twenty dollars and like that's like cool side project that is very easy easy to get started. And Correct. Andre, do you see something else on on your side like of the community? No, but- but the community-wise, it's I would say it's a lot of IBMers, but also I think the chance as a customer working on open source makes this attractive because you can resolve or sol- solve mm-hmm. problems you 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 might not be solving with a with, a, with another operating system here, or it's the same as on other platforms. That's what I see. But the contribution is huge here by by the IBM team. So I'm here in an in an area where almost everybody is working open source and. Or contributes to it because this is the business we are in here. Is the ready uh, Red Hat like acquisition change something for you guys? Like the IBM, like HashiCorp, Red Hat acquisitions? Does it affect the mainframe or not really like the day to day? I mean, anything with open source will. Um, I can't. I don't know anything about the HashiCorp stuff, but like I, I, you know, anything anything that happens in this space eventually will trickle down to us um, because we do run these tools and we, you know, we want to port everything to the platform. So, <laughs> so as soon as something comes onto our plate or usually it's a, it's a client need um, or it's it's something that's integrated in one of our products where you're like, oh, and then we need Z support. And we're like, all right, we're on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with Red Hat, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also a Red Hat PE, so I have uh, two places here working very <laughs> with, with folks. Um, um, I mean, unfortunately, I'm getting only paid by IBM and not by Reddit as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but, with the the people at IBM, you know. Uh, yeah, but but the point is, I guess, on one side, Red Hat was already on the platform so far. It's it's not like they, yeah. yes, they, there was much changed. And I mean, this was kind of, and, and Red Hat is still kind of an independent company. We are working very close with them, and and but it's also kind of. We were used to work with them on the community base, and just to the title integration, we want to have that on the platform. We might need to spend some those efforts, which are important, to get this on the platform. But but what we are doing, and that's that's maybe a, that would would not have been done before. But therefore, we are integrated more or less in the Red Hat processes, and IBM is really providing all those kind of services to get it on the. Which sometimes is very interesting because you are bridging the the kind of of different work environments, and 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 that's that's also very thrilling, I would say. But um, on the other side, we have one goal in in getting the products being supported. For as so on one side, you have this community work, which is always kind of yeah independent of because you can you cannot plan. To say, okay, now I want to have it because the community might see something different, and you have to discuss this through, and you have to think out out of the box. So this is one side, which is maybe kind of we are used to it already, and this is what what brings us together. And then on the other side, we are working towards to get when we have something upstream being done, working on the downstream stuff, concentrating on getting this done, support for the customers so that they can have their solution being in a supported way and. And 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 then yeah we 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 have to to bridge those gaps sometimes um, with 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 a lot of communication but that that makes it really interesting to be honest and I would say it's a very I I like it because I think this to to keep it like this makes it very powerful for me because I mean still this this agile kind of work environment from a smaller company but dedicated to fully open source. I mean, it's not said that IBM is not dedicated to open source. Best example is here, Elizabeth, Mr. Effort, or what we are doing here. It's, it's But we're still working as, a, we are a hardware company, providing that hardware and working around of this and, and providing the best solution for the customer for it. And therefore, it's a very good match to get things here together. Okay, I think that we almost ran out of time. Any last word, Elizabeth, Oliver? 
Uh, I just, I want to say to anyone listening, if they, this is the first time they've heard of mainframes, like, uh-huh. don't let it be the last. These are really cool things. I've, I put out some articles and other things, just kind of giving brief overviews of the technical stuff. It's just so cool. Just, just take a look. Well, we will add it to the notes in the, in the show. Great. Right. And it's fascinating. I just can't not say okay. anything. I'll be honest, like, again, for me, not the mainframe guy, like, it was super interesting, first of all, like, hearing about, like, mainframe in general, and more than that, like, both mainframe in open source and mainframe in Kubernetes, like, two things that, I'll be honest, pretty this call, I didn't really knew existed, and uh, so it was, like, super interesting and, like, a, a bit different than a lot of the things that, you know, at least I worked on, like, a day-to-day, uh, day-to-day, so uh, it was a pleasure having you here. And uh, I will meet maybe in KubeCon, Elizabeth, Olga, like if you are going, I'd be happy to do coffee or beer. That'd be great. Thanks. Be cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Kubernetes for humans.